مرغ باغ ملکوتم مرغ باغ ملکوتم نیم از عالم خاک دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخت بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وفيل الصلاه ما فخر الكائنات واكرم الموجودات حضره فخر عالم محمد مصطفى صلوات اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد بيا بيا کنایا بی چو ما دیگر یاری چو ما به جمله جهان خود کجاست دیداری As you may have noticed we are in a place that represents uh, one of the culminations perhaps the culmination of our civilization The early Muslims represented a culmination of inward wisdom but the civilizational story of Islam whereby the connection of knowledge to wisdom was made refined and palatable and successful is something that evolved and is called upon to continue to evolve. The Arabs had their day and handed the torch of civilization to the Persian peoples who then handed their torch of civilization after the Mongol invasions to the Mughals in the east and to the Central Asians to the north and to the Ottomans in the eastern Mediterranean and in North Africa. So what we're seeing here is a kind of culmination that in Istanbul to this day you find the most sophisticated Islamic arts and calligraphy and illumination and tajweed and singing and this still despite the uh, blanket or the pillow that has been put over their face for the last 80 years to try and suffocate the living breath of Islam out of the Turkish people, it continues to be here. If you want the reality of our civilization, come here. Don't go to the Middle East any longer, come here still, despite everything. And it is in a place like this that we realize this cumulative value of our civilization that sometimes we find it hard to grasp because we think, and it's in a hadith, many hadiths in fact, that indicate that the best of generations is my generation, then that which follows, then that which follows. There is spiritually a kind of entropy, a running down of the batteries after the initial explosion of prophetic light, and that's to be expected. Energy runs downhill. But civilization is something more complicated. And necessarily, the success of Islam is to be measured in the ability of its upholders to transform outward knowledge into inward wisdom. And that's really what we mean when we say sacred civilization. Outward knowledge is relatively easy to come by. You just need a reasonably good memory. On a certain mechanical level, you could even say that the internet contains more knowledge than any human being has ever had. But it doesn't have any wisdom. So what is required is the transformation of what in Rumi's tradition is called Danesh, knowledge, into Khirad, wisdom. And this is what this particular institution has always represented. And those who are buried here and in the great cemeteries nearby are people who came here specifically to learn that alchemy. How can we take what we know outwardly and turn it into something that is part of our being inwardly in the most best possible way. How can we effect that transmutation, that deepening of our faith? And this is uh, exampled in the life of Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi, Hazrat Liri, um, uh, in his own biography, in his life, because he used to say, first I was raw, then I was cooked, then I was burnt. What he means by this is that, first of all, he was just a scholar. 
people pointed to him in the streets of Konya and said, Those go, there goes the second Ghazali. He was amazing. He knew the disciplines of his day. He was the Khatib, the Friday Imam of the great mosque of Ala ad din in Konya, the greatest city of uh, Muslim Anatolia in the 13th century, wearing the proud white robes of the scholar. But he was raw, and it was something inward that happened to him, different to Ghazali's own transmutation, but probably in its essence, the same kind of alchemy was at work that turned him into Mevlana, the one who inspired this building and inspires millions today through the extraordinary effulgence, the unique power and luminescence of his verse. How did he manage to do that? One of the great Sheikh al-Islams of the Ottoman Empire, Ibn Kamal, early 16th century, who was the Sheikh al-Islam in the time of Yawul Sultan Salim and accompanied him in his journey to uh, uh, free Syria, Palestine, Egypt from the Mamluks, had a dream. And he dreamt that he saw the Holy Prophet wasallam, and he was holding in his hand a copy of the Mathnavi. And he was saying, this is how you turn what is outward into what is inward and is in a way that is pleasing to me. And Ibn Kamal, who was the Mufti of the empire and handled over 2,000 fatwas a day and wrote his great tafsir and many works, several hundred works, in fact. This is um, uh, Ibn Kamal, known as Kamal Pashazadeh in the Turkish world. He was buried only a few hundred yards from here. Rahmatullahi Ali. He could see this, that we need this way of taking all of the outward knowledge, and Ibn Kamal had more of it than just about anybody, and turning it into wisdom. Khirad, hikmat, how do we do that? That requires something that is to do with the ruh, the spirit, the inward tenderness, the humanity of us all. So there must be a tradition, there must be a set of institutions that help us to cross that bridge and to make that transformation. So Rumi himself effected that transformation at the hands of his own philosopher's stone, Al-Kabirit Al-Ahmar, Shemsi Tabriz, who uh, had the very, a very strange relationship with him. At first, we're told, Rumi was in uh, Damascus where he was studying, and out of a crowd came this wild dervish from the back of beyond, from the Caucasus region, patched robes, rather scandalous individual, ran up to this young theologian, kissed his hand, and ran off again. And that ignited in Rumi a certain spark that became this extraordinary global phenomenon that uh, we see today. The Shamsi Tabriz who appeared again in Konya and who turned Rumi from a doctor of the law into a hand-clapping lover. But in a way which in the Ghazalian mold showed the reality and the truth of the outward you could say he too was a Hudrat al-Islam. In our age, we need to consider how we use these texts. Traditionally, you studied them with an expert who had an ijaza. You were part of a silsila, but a place like this, despite the good intentions that went into its restoration. Where is the sheikh? Where is the silsila? Where is the whole mechanism? In our age, the sheikhs say that the highest possibilities of this inward knowledge, this seeing the reality of the sharia, being a fully ignited, loving human being, is still possible. Allah is still al-qarib, and the veil which veils us from him is not different from what it was in the past. It's just that we have fewer people to help us. But that veil can still be lifted, it can still be penetrated, raised, uh, annihilated. We can still become people of wisdom. But where is the dalil? Where is the one who will help us? Where is the, uh, the supporter? Well, the ulama of Istanbul point out that there are only three texts in the history of Islam 
which have the uh, adjective Sharif attached to them. They say Bukhari Sharif, Shifa Sharif, and Masnavi Sharif. There's no other text that has that, um, has that adjective. Bukhari Sharif, of course we know what that is. Shifa Sharif, of course, is the Shifa of Qadi Ayad, which gives us the taste of the sweet honey of the love of the Chosen One, alayhi salatu salam, which is indispensable. And then Mathnavi Sharif, which is the poetic culmination, the civilizational expression in the most exquisite and cultivated form for really cultivated people of uh, the, the fullness of Islam outwardly and inwardly. That's why it's noble. If you have those three forms of knowledge, even if you can't find a teacher, and it may not be your fault, don't be too hard on yourself. You may just not find such a place. Deme ashk ichre kim eder beni ershad tariq sen heman yolagir Allah veliyot tawfiq. Do not keep grumbling. Who is going to take my hand and take me on this path? Hmm? Enter this path yourself and Allah is wali tawfiq. Allah is the one who gives success. The shaykh is just somebody who makes things easier. But ultimately the one who is musallik, the one who takes you forward is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huwa yudrikul absar. So the ulama increasingly nowadays are saying all of these sort of structures, the paraphernalia, the rituals, the beautiful things, uh, we don't need them and the culture that generated them and in the context of which this made sense is no longer our culture and our reality. Instead what we need is this kunu rabbaniyin. You'll find this ishara amongst many of the sheikhs. They're saying in this age what can we do? We're too weak really to make a big difference, to make big sacrifices. We've all got a thousand and one weaknesses and we struggle to deal with even one of them. Uh, what can we do? Kunu Rabbaniyin, be lordly, be attached to the Rabbal Alameen, be attached, have your heart constantly focused on him. The very least, that's what you can do, and that's the essence of it. All of this great effusion of thousands of ways, and turuq, and asnaf, and masharib in the history of Islam, those are just means to an end. Don't turn them into an end in themselves. What kind of turban have I got? Have I got the tasbih that has this, that, and the other? Am I reading this? All of that is quite possibly, since it generally pertains to an age that isn't like our age, something that can get in the way. And a real sheikh is not going to be one who burdens you with a million and one little rituals and, and practices. It's really about remembrance. That's the thing we can't do without dhikrullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without it, we're miserable and lost with it, everything else comes easily. Everything becomes easy when Allah's name is present, really present, not just outwardly. How do I pronounce the name Allah? Have I got the rules of Tajweed correct? But inwardly, is my heart saying that name? Saying it once with the heart is more beneficial than saying it a million times with the tongue. But for us, uh, religion is all outward stuff, which is why sometimes it feels like an uncomfortable suit of clothes. Kind of not what we are. That's because it's on the outward. To the extent that it's inwardly what we are, the outward take, looks after itself. <coughs> the one whose inwardness creates his outwardness is beautiful in his outwardness. The one whose outwardness is trying to shape his inwardness is the uncomfortable kind of pietist believer. The awkward person who's trying to work it out, who finds it all really quite an effort, which is what we are. And Maulana Rumi's great insight, and it's the insight of the Qur'an itself, is that it's all about mahabba, all about love. It's all about this principle of ashq. This is ashq yolo the way of love. The thing that connects the knowledge to the wisdom, the Danish to the khirad is love. And this is the prophetic insight of the um, hadith and nawafil. What is it that pushes you on until you get to that amazing final stage? فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُ كُنْتُ سَمْعَهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ وَبَصَرَهُ الَّذِي يُبْصِرُ بِهِ and so on. That's one of the most staggering hadiths of Islam. 
one of the few hadith that has its own name even and it's a sound hadith mahabba la yataqarrabu ilayya 'abdi bi shay'in ahabba ilayya mimma aftaratuhu alayhi the first stage it's the thing that you're doing that allah loves because love means the recognition of what is beautiful and right and appropriate and luminous if you're in a state of darkness you can't really claim that allah loves you to say god loves sinners is kind of misunderstanding what the meaning of love could be allah loves what we were created as made the angels bow down to that and he has appointed for us jannatul khuld which shows his love for what we are called to become but in our current mucky state not really what he loves about us is the ta'a that we do so you do the basic acts and he loves those acts and that's what this hadith is saying look carefully at these great hadiths because in every word there is those a dars a lesson hikma لا يتقرب إلي عبدي بشيء أحب إلي مما افترضت عليه. My slave draws near to me with nothing more beloved to me than that which I have made obligatory upon him. He doesn't love you in your distraction and your messiness and your fiddling with your phone and your all of that. He doesn't really love that. His رب العالمين. He loves what is lovable. But the prayer that is lovable because that is putting you outwardly in the form of the chosen one, صلى الله عليه وسلم. That's when you're في أحسن التقويم. At least your forehead is doing what it's supposed to do. Who knows what your thoughts are doing at that moment? At least your forehead is doing that, and that's what he loves. And that's how we progress. And this is a very embodied religion. Outward and the inward, the same kind of you know, two sides of one reality. You can't really separate them. The mind without the body, what could that be? Ibn Sina, years ago, said, Would I really be myself if I was suspended in a kind of tank of liquid? at body temperature so I couldn't detect anything the senses were supplying no information to me at all would it still be me and this is a problem philosophers of mind are always talking about this what is the self what is the khudi the essence of, of what we are mm. well you can't actually detach it from the body the body it, it shapes the soul the soul determines what the body does and that's why we have physical resurrection when we stand it will be in uh, forms, tan, surat, not just ma'na. So, uh, this is the wisdom of this prophetic hadith. What is outwardly right about you at the beginning is uh, you're actually, for however long your prayers take every day, 12, 13 minutes, who knows, Allah is loving something about you. And the way of Islam is to change that love so that it is you that he loves rather than what you're doing that he loves and that's where the hadith goes next and then my slave continues to draw near to me with optional acts of obedience until I love him ah. that's not where we are now that's where we're supposed to be. Allah's love for us. Look at your heart. Look at your intentions. Look at the things you think about. Look at what matters to you. Decide how much Allah loves that. But imagine if the outward form of your prayer was the inward form of your spirit. If you were Adamic in that original sense. If you were taken way back, and Mawlana Rumi is always reminding of that, Ruzi Alast, the original day, before really the Adamic prologue, the prologue before the prologue, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? That's where we belong. And Rumi says this, An Shahre Mast, that is our city. We were the friends of the angels. We were in the spheres. Let us go there again, friend, because that's our city. That's where we belong. We 
where does this world of clay come from? Where is the higher world from? Where do we belong? Manzelemar, Kebriast. The place where we belong is, is with the divine glory. It's not in this world of, of clay. The angels are not bowing down to the, the clay from which Adam was made. Iblis thought that's what it was all about. And that's fundamentally wrong. And we tend to prioritize ourselves on the basis of what the clay wants. I want this treat, I want that holiday, I want this woman, I want that box of chocolates, I want whatever. It's that, the clay, the stuff, the chak, that is driving us. Sometimes he calls it the donkey, uh, the donkey that's leading us along. But uh, the angels are not bowing down to that, certainly not, because that's kind of... If you look at human beings and their passions, compared to them to the passions of anything else in the animal orders of creation, and you'll see we really kind of, as philosophelin, we can really go down there. We can really, huh? if for instance, the world's donkeys were to go online and were in charge of the internet, huh? the internet would not be full of the kind of filth that Benny Adam puts on the internet. We can go way down way down. And in the Hekam book, the Contentions book, you can see the Nietzsche quote, nihilism is the uncanniest of guests. Because of our capacity to go way down into those dark, shadowy, smoky, infernal realms, we kind of breathe the, the, the presence of Iblis, alayhi la'ana. We intuit his reality because of the, the power, the, the, the diabolical magnetism of our lower desires. We can do that and we can see that that power drives a lot of the modern world hmm? making money out of everybody's weaknesses isn't that what it's all about most of the time pretty sad how much TV scheduling is about human nobility I don't know that's not what people want to watch they want to watch Jerry Springer hmm? that's where we're at as Benny Adam at the moment and it's only the divine Lotfa that is preventing him from telling Israfil, this is really enough, stop it all now. It's only his lot is giving us a little bit longer because really we're, we're filthy. Huh? He has given us this world like an emerald in the middle of the majesty of space. He has given us so much and so much and so much and he's given us this book that says he has given you so much and that's the gift of the Quran, no other scripture presents the divine gift so purely. No other scripture does that. It's all about gift. He keeps on giving and giving and giving, but we're kind of ungrateful. That's the meaning of kufr, really. And it's become so bad and we're so stinking as a kind of infestation, a fungus on the surface of the planet, just looking for whatever's ugliest and most disgusting that maybe it's all going to stop soon. Maybe we'll stop it because of our greed, the planet can't cope. Even the air is not what it was. Things are pretty bad. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is arham al and that's what, you know, that's what keeps us going. The reality of that and the hope for that. In other words, the Rahim, he's called himself that as Rahman, which is for everybody. And the Rahman, which is the, the one who manifests that mercy specifically for the believers, and we hope for that as well. But for those two names, in this book he's given us those two names most conspicuously. What chance do we have? Not much, I'm afraid. Allah, please do not judge us according to what we deserve should be our most heartfelt prayer, and we all know that one. But, yeah, the Holy Prophet says, إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدِنَ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ I just hope that he will embrace me in his mercy. So Rumi is seeing this. He's seeing that really Allah has given us this opportunity to be like Adam. The angels, let alone anything else in creation, can bow down to us. We can be Khulafa al-Rahman, amazing, majestic beings suspended between heaven and earth. Fi surat al-Rahman, in the form of the all-merciful, manifesting those extraordinary names. And one of Rumi's names for Adam is Allam al Beg, which is a kind of strange Arabic-Turkish compound. That's what we are. The Lord of He taught the names. Mazhar al-Asma, a human being 
displays those names, and that's really what the angels are bowing down to. The presence of the Rahman in Adam, the presence of the Latif in Adam, the presence of the Aziz, the presence of the Jabbar, the angels bow down to that, not our khak, our clay, our muck. Certainly not. So we have to recognize these names and follow, and this is really the basic commandment that goes through Rumi again and again, to khalaqu bi akhlaqillah, acquire, emulate the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these 99 names indicate qualities of perfection. And how we do that is the, the sunnah. Khafile salari ma fakhri jihan mustafast. Our caravan leader is Mustafa, pride of the world. I'm not going to join some other caravan, who knows where the other ones are going, but his caravan is the one that is uh, one for the Ummah of Islam. He is the pride, um, pride of the world, Fakhri Jihan. So this is why humanity nowadays is kind of sniffing at Rumi and trying to figure out what this is all about. And they can't find something kind of filthy and disgusting in him. There's some wild stories in there, but it really is a very ambitious program. That's why we call it Sharif of ennobling us. Karamna Bani Adam. Rumi is saying you can move from being raw to being cooked with this heat of love. And then you can be burnt, which is the third stage, which is what happens you see it in the Divan, which is the poem that I started with, which inshallah we'll look at this evening, which is where things really get hmm, very hot. Well, this love gets so extreme that who knows what might happen. And we have in this Ummah, which is the Ummah of Allah's Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, plenty of examples of people driven almost out of their wits by this love, by this mahabba. Not so much nowadays. If somebody is sort of catching your eye in the masjid, it's probably because he's playing with his phone or because he's blaming somebody for praying the wrong way or he's, who knows what it is, but it's not because he's kind of out of his mind with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's kind of mm, sad. We don't see that. But in this city, there were many, many, many ashiqan, many lovers of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the reality of what this hadith indicates. The hadith, the sound hadith says, Allah loves you when you're at that degree and then Kuntu I am his hearing with which he hears and his eye with which he sees and the hand with which he smikes, or smites and the foot with which he walks If he seeks my protection, I'll protect him. If he seeks my victory, I'll grant him my victory. And this was the basic source of strength of Adawlat al-Uthmani al this place was closely linked to the palace. The sheikh who was sitting here would very often be teaching the sultan or with the sultan. Or the sultan would be holding the halter of the chelebi of the dervishes as he came to this place. And that was an honor for the sultan. Or the sultan would ask for the honor of holding the towel as the chelebi or the dede who was sitting here performed his wudu. That was the relationship. The basic core of the turban of the uh, Ottoman sultans was the taj and the sikke of the Mevlevi dervishes. When the sultan went off for jihad, he came to the maqam of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and he would be given his sword by the chelabi of the, the Mevlevi dervishes. They were hand in glove. And that was the reason for all of their victories right up into the hearts of Europe and it was only the Persians attacking it right at the other end of the empire that kind of made it hard because they were fighting on two fronts and um, but who knows who knows what might have happened Allah's taqdeer is all that could happen and uh, we are content with his decree but an extraordinary combination and if the Muslims want victory today they should look at how that victory was possible that was not some kind of ideological um, possibility but it was a reality those armies were triumphant so that's a funny thing 
an empire, perhaps the greatest multicultural, stable empire the world has ever seen. A single family ruling from, what, 1280 to 1925, more or less incomparable. The British Empire lasted less than a century. The Ottomans, six centuries. Very impressive. Uh, based on what principle? The principle of these Mevlevi dervishes, whose principle was, of all things, love. The Turks are warrior people, fighters. But the basic principle in all of this was ashq or love because of that hadith of the chosen one sallallahu alayhi wasallam and when the shaykh al-islam of the empire saw the holy prophet in the dream he saw him holding the copy of the the mathnavi something to remember if somebody hasn't been given ashq or love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when you have that the truth of it is that you love his creation the one who really loves allah loves others Loves his prophets, loves his awliya, loves their books, loves the ummah, loves creation ultimately. The ummah which is at least called to be part of the ummah of Islam. Loves that within them which is conformed to at least the outward form of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. That's the sign of the real scholar, the one who is Rabbani, who is lordly. So uh, this is important. And it's a sign of our useless decadent that the people, decadence that the people who are reading Rumi nowadays, most of them not even Muslims. Maybe they don't have our complexes and traumas and who knows what, ethnic traumas making it hard for people to love anything. Um, so every last New Age guru in America, even Madonna has you know, Rumi lyrics. They're kind of clapping their hands. They haven't got the way because they haven't got the caravan leader, alayhi salatu wasalam, they don't read that bit of, of Rumi. That's kind of the religious stuff and they think they can cut it out. But we are the heirs of this heritage, but where are these places now? We're building places like this in New York and Washington and London and so forth, thousands of mosques, more and more masajid, all with the same kind of blameful noises coming from the minbar every Friday. But uh, where are the places where there is love? People who are al mutahabuna bi Those who love one another for the sake of my majesty. That's a combination the Ottomans really understood. And it's something the Sahaba really understood. This is not about some kind of hippie liberal Christianity where you love your neighbor and believe in the latest gay rights rhetoric because love everybody. No. There's a jalal, a rigor to Islam, which is the key to understanding the love of the believers for one another. Well, we've kind of got that very out of focus. We just have the jalal, but not the al bona, those who love one another for its sake. So it just becomes a kind of principle of fearsomeness rather than the beauty of, of majesty. Anyway, so this is where it's at. This is this, this place and these um, people and the Ziyarat Gahi Khamushan, which is outside the great, great Mevlevi graveyard where so many incomparable people are awaiting the Qiyamah. This is a great place to be and to reflect. And inshallah, there'll be an opportunity in the coming days to think more about this place, what it represents, um, what our relationship and our adab should be in this place. And don't underestimate what this place represents. Uh, the Khilafa built this. And the world's greatest poet inspired it. And the world's last prophet gave it its fragrance and form, don't underestimate this place. So what I want to do is to look at some of the ghazals of the Divani Shamsi Tabriz. We know this less than we know the Masnavi. Most of it has not been translated. It's a pretty enormous work. Uh, because of this principle that in Islam, love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really inseparable from love for others. That we know Diwani Shamsi Tabriz is named after Shamsi Tabriz and Rumi Shams, 
are in this extraordinary fraternal state of, of love for each other. The Masnavi is also a kind of dialogue between Maulana and Hossam ad-Din, who is one of the ones he loved, one of his closest disciples, uh, but he pops up less often. But uh, the degree of the Masnavi is teaching, in other words, explaining how you make your knowledge real. You know how to pray, great, but does your heart know how to pray? How can you make the outward lesson create the inward wisdom? The Danish becomes the Khirad, how do we do that? How can you put your heart in sujood? How can you really be detached in Ramadan? How can you be truly attuned to the majesty of the house when you're on the Hajj? How can you make that inward journey, that deepening of faith? The Masnavi is about that. And because the thing that keeps Hikmah away from us is the silliness of the nafs. There's a lot of playfulness and a lot of humor in the Masnavi. Humor, and again this comes up in the contentions, is a funny thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in human beings, uniquely in, in human beings. And it has something to do with the divine determination to assist us to see the absurdity of kufr. Uh, Allah has made things really quite clear. The heart sees, the senses see, the mind is there, but it's hawa, ego, whim, that gets in the way of the obvious spectacle of tawheed. <coughs> it's really absurd. It's like sitting somebody in front of a, pointing somebody to the moon, and he says, banana, banana, banana. And that's what human beings are doing now, that's kufr. And yet we laugh. That's really the basis of humor. It's a strange incompatibility of, of reality with the silliness of the human nafs. It's a funny thing. And in this uh, tradition of Turkish Sufism, uh, humor is important. The Mullah Nasruddin is an important sheikh, if you like, pointing out how silly we are, how silly things are, um, how obvious things ought to be, how absurd we are to reject that in which our own happiness lies. So uh, the Divan Tej Shamsi Tabriz is with this wild dervish from uh, the Caucasus who disappears. It's an odd, mysterious story. I'm sure you all know it already. And this is where he gets burnt. Masnavi is fairly easy to understand. Um, but the Divan, about half of it, even native speakers of Farsi can't really work it out. Tricky. Partly because it came to Rumi in states of kind of ecstatic, mysterious conditions of the soul. He used to walk around in Konya and his murids, his disciples, would make sure that wherever he went, he would have always with him at least three people, somebody who could write down the poetry if it came in Arabic or in Turkish or in Persian. <clears throat> it comes spontaneously. He could be in the Hammam, halfway out of the Hammam, and suddenly he produces this ghazal, and it's amazing. And the next day he'll have forgotten it. So somebody has to write it down. And that's basically how we got this, this um, extraordinary document, Divani Shamsid Tabariz, which is higher than the Masnavi. Masnavi is this extraordinary thing that makes you know, the, the new age spirituality uh, industry in America the hugely profitable thing that it is. Um, but the Divan is something that, whose ocean they've not even uh, begun to skim. So when you look at the divan, uh, very often you have to get used to the fact that it's hard to understand. And it's important to note that music in this tradition is significant. Uh, and uh, the divan can often best be understood as music rather than words. It's that kind of poetry. It, it leads to a certain state. Uh, and uh, there's something of the wisdom of Sort of the genre of revelation even in this. The Qur'an, if you read it as if it's any other text, a novel or an engineering manual or even a collection of poetry, it's not like any of those things and it seems strange. One subject is followed by another subject and then the rhythm changes and the rhyme changes and it's strange. But we know the effect that it can have because it produced the Ummah of Islam. It's successful sacred literature. But how it works is mysterious bit like the Hajj. How does the Hajj work? It's a load of practices that are unlike anything else in Islam, but we can see the effect that it has on people. 
Amazing. Hajj is one of the great transformative alchemical mysteries of the Sharia. When I was living in Jeddah, I knew this uh, German guy. He converted to Islam, kind of, in order to marry this Muslim girl, but, um, uh, but he had Muslim on his bitaka. So he said, I'll go and look at the Hajj. I'll go on the Hajj. And when he came back, a completely transformed from a deeply secular person, somebody who drank quite a bit, came back completely transformed. His wife, of course, was horrified. That's not the person she'd wanted to marry, but it, it affected him. But who can say how that works? The Tawaf and then the seven Sa'i and the Arafat, divine mystery. But this is Khirad, this is wisdom, and the sheikhs can have an insight into how those things work. So when we look at the Divani Shamsi Tabriz, we're looking at something that is a sacred or transformative object, a kind of talisman, something that changes in a mysterious, transmutative, osmotic way. So we shouldn't get too depressed if we can't understand. Because in a sense, Rumi, when producing this, was in a state where understanding was kind of left behind and truth was there. And truth ultimately is beyond speech. Music is beyond speech and reaches for higher states. Uh, words can do that as well. Now, because of Rumi's own having been cooked and then burnt, he is really trying to encourage everybody else to have the same experience and he's always saying two things. Firstly, he's saying, listen to me, Bishnal. And then he's saying, come, Be'a. So the beginning of the Masnavi uh, is Bishnav Aznai Chun Shikayat Mikonad Vihaz Juda Iha Hikayat Mikonad. Listen to the reed flute. It's lamenting. Lamenting how it was torn, telling the story of how it was torn from the reed bed. That's one of his nice images. And he kind of hits you with it because he's saying, This is our condition. Why are we suffering? It's almost Buddhistic. Why is this suffering? Why are we uncomfortable? Why are things not how we feel they should be? Because you're separated, you're in exile. It's like the flute, those lamenting, sad Turkish sounds. The, the nay, the reed flute, is lamenting the fact that it's missing where it came from. And that's our problem. Uh, we don't belong here. Manzalemar kebriast, our abode is the abode of glory. We don't really exist to be here. And we're not here for very long in this world of khak or clay. Zaasimani tu chubaran bebame alim khak behersu i bidavide binavi dan rofti. He compares our souls to the rain. He says, from your sky they came like raindrops upon the clay roof of this world. And then they ran around on the roof until they all went out by the same hole, the same gutter, which is the grave. We all end up that way. And that's what we are, like raindrops landing on the clay of, of this world. But it's not rare we belong. So he says these things. And often in the Masnavi, he says, Bishnal, listen. It's a kind of hortatory. It's a sermon. He's telling us. He's got information. There's facts to learn here. Uh, but in the Divan, he says, Be'ah, come. It's not even about information any longer. It's about just the need to come. Suluk, Ravan Degan, coming. So we started off, we're not going to finish this ghazal, but we started off uh, this one from the Divani Shamsi Tabriz. Beya, beya, kinea, bi chuma, diger, yari, chuma, bi jumlei, jihani, khud, kojas, didari. Beya, beya, come, come. You will find no other friend but me. In the whole of his world, where will you find a beloved like me? And again, because this is kind of ecstatic, shut. Um, he's kind of ventriloquizing for Rabb al Alameen. It's Allah speaking here through the poet. Come, come, come not to the poet, but to 
the creator of the poet is not there, he's just the reed flute, and it's the player that is making the sound. The wind is not from the flute, the ruh is not from ourselves, it's um, from Allah's command. So he says, come, come, you won't find another friend like me. Well, amanna wa sadaqna, it's true. Allah is the true yar, the true friend. Um, everybody else lets us down, dies, forgets, isn't with us, all kinds of disappointing things. But the true friend is the one who's always there. There's no jafa, only vefa. No turning away, no distance, no moment when he's not paying attention to you, but just vefa. Just uh, faithfulness. That's what you want from a friend. And this is his quality of al qarib, the near. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانٌ That's what it is, the, the Yar, the Divine Friend. إِنِّي قَرِيبٌ He is near. So many of Allah's names in the Qur'an come in pairs. الْخَافِدْ وَالْرَافِعْ وَالْمُعِزْ وَالْمُذِلْ وَالْمُحِي وَالْمُمِيتْ But not al qarib he never calls himself Al-Ba'id, and we'd kind of think it was very strange to think of Allah as Ba'id. Aqrabu ilayhi min habli al-warid. Closer to him than his jugular vein. That's the divine. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qareeb, always. We're Ba'id. True. Very far. But he is very near, and he has said it. And part of the humor in Rumi is looking at our incapacity to detect the divine proximity which means the proximity of truth and goodness and beauty and appropriateness and joy why don't we reach for those things that's what the world is made of the world's being is the divine rahma but instead we get ourselves into these states of exile these stories that we tell this sleep and they'll have a lot to say in this ghazal about sleep we're just asleep. So he says, Be'a, Be'a, come, come. From the verb Amadan, to come, which comes often in this spiritual sense in, in the, the Masnavi. In the whole of his world, where will you find a beloved like me? Mm. Love, he's talking about that principle. This process of coming to him, coming to me, is because we love him subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the magnetism that's what draws us towards him and everything that is beloved to us in the world is so only insofar as we detect with our souls because we never choose to love it's something spontaneous hmm? you can't go to a beautiful woman and say I have decided to love you if you do that she'll tell you where to get off it's spontaneous that's the whole point it's out of our control and religion real religion is that which pulls us magnetizes us, yanks us out of our comfort zone towards that area where we are kind of helpless and embarrassed. And another fundamental metaphor in Rumi is this metaphor of love. It's not quite a metaphor even, it's a reality. He speaks of عشقي majazi wa عشقي haqiqi, metaphorical love and true love. When you love anything in this world, a beautiful person, a beautiful place, a beautiful time, you love Ramadan, you love whatever it might be, is because you detect in that thing certain of the beautiful qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're kind of a mirror in which the light of God is reflected imperfectly because this world is made up of imperfect things. Love, therefore, is this transformative thing. Don't underestimate it. So he says, where in the world will you find another beloved, Dildar, that which ravishes the heart, like Dilara, this little girl on this Rehla called Dilara, who's ravishing everybody. This Dil, which is the essence of us, is what is to be activated. So they even say in Persian, Dil az dastrafte. The heart's got out of, gone out of the hand. You no longer control your emotions. That's how you say to fall in love in, in Farsi. It's beyond you now. And this uncontrolled quality is Rumi's way 
And it's really ultimately from this hadith, the prophetic way of saying Islam, submission. Submission is about not being in charge, it's about handing over. Sami'na wa ata'na. Ufawwidu amri ilallah. Handing it over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helplessly. Giving up your own tadbir, your own ability to do stuff. Giving it all up. That's the same as this emotion of love because that's the state where you're helpless, you're not in control. So he begins with that line, and then this is now line two. Baya, baya, bebehev, su yi, ruzgar, mabor. Kenis nagli torah, pishi, gayri, bazari. Come, come. Don't spend all of your life wandering this way and that. Kenis nagli torah, pishi, gayri, bazari. The image is now a kind of commercial one, since for you have these coins your capital, your coins, and there's only one place where you can use them, which is his marketplace. If you want something valuable, go to his marketplace, his bazaar, and you can make a profit. And again, Rumi's from this great commercial culture, and he often uses this kind of commercial language, and it's in the, the Quran as well, uh, the idea of trading with Allah. هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى تِجَارَةٍ تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Shall I point out to you a trade which will save you from a painful punishment? This is the deal that we cut. But how do we trade? That must be coins. The coins is, well, what we can do. Not much, is it? We don't last very long. But this seramaya, this capital that we have is our trading goods uh, and one of the people that we'll be looking at later this week inshallah Sheikh Ghalib one of his ghazals where he talks about Mevlana Rumi uh, he has this beautiful ghazal where he says Efendim sin jihan de atibaram varsa sendendir mayani aashigan da shtiharam varsa sendendir Benim faiza hayatum hasl ruh revanimsen eger sermaye imrim de karum varsus endende. Very beautiful ghazal which is addressed to Maulana Rumi. He says, uh, My master, if I have any esteem in this world, it is because of you. If I have any fame amongst the lovers, it is from you. Eger sermaye imrim de karam varsus endendir. If there is any profit on the capital which is in my life, it is from you. It is Rumi who taught him to use this nakt, these coins, these days that we have, the ability that we have to say the name of Allah, these instants, everything that we have that we can trade with, with Allah. It's Rumi who showed him how to use those in the correct bazaar in the correct trading place rather than to use them for some other stuff that doesn't last in some other bazaar, the bazaar of market capitalism. Uh, but Allah's bazaar is where we can actually expect something permanent, a permanent investment for um, what we have. Um, but what we have, and Rumi often says that the capital these coins, they're gold coins, zarjin, and gold is something precious, something imperishable, something that is to do with the eternal and hence something to do with the ruh. Gold is uh, related to the divine nature. It's incorruptible, it's permanent, it's the most precious thing, it shines, it can be mirror-like. So let's read a bit from the Masnavi, and I've been told that I have to fall chamush shortly, um, inshallah. Uh, but let's finish this second line. And again, you have to listen to this with your soul. Before this, we were one people. No one could tell whether we were good or bad. Both counterfeit and true coin were in circulation in the world, since all was night 
and we were night travelers. Then the son of the, son of the prophets rose. It said, O adulterated coins, go. O pure ones, come. An eye is necessary to tell colors apart. An eye is needed to tell rubies from pebbles. The eye can see a jewel among rubbish. Pieces of trash hurt the eye. These base counterfeits hate the day, but the mind's golden nuggets are in love with it. Since day is the mirror in which they become known and by which golden coins are honored, Allah calls the resurrection a day because day shows forth the beauty of red and yellow. Hence the reality of daytime is the inmost perception of Allah's friends. Beside their noon, day is only a shadow. So here he's saying these coins that we have are ultimately ours insofar as they are from the soul, jandan, they are from the essence. Spending a day for Allah is not really spending of your capital unless you do it for Allah sincerely. So it has to come from the soul, jandan, the gold coins which you expend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have to come from the essence of, of what you are. And the essence of what you are is golden. The ruh is golden. And he's saying here that the son of the prophets, alayhi salatu salam, when he rose, Arabia had been in darkness, nobody knew right from wrong, they had no idea. The son of the prophets rose and there was a day, rose, and the gold started to shine. And the sahaba came into Islam and their quality became evident and then all of the dark things started to crawl away like insects when a stone has been lifted up and the Abu Jahl and the Abu Lahab run away from the sun. And this is one of the functions of the Qur'an, as well as the function of the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that people's souls are discerned. The good people start to shine, and the bad people show themselves in their true color. So this is part of the, the symbolism of, of gold in, in Rumi. Now, He then goes on, I have to skip some of the, the commentary here. Incidentally, the, the best commentary on Rumi by a very blessed man, Sheikh Tahir al-Mevlavi, who was here and is buried in the um, Khamushan mezar just here, the graveyard of the silent ones. That's what they called the graveyard of this teke. Um, Tahir al-Mevlavi was a government official who was attached to this teke and um, taught himself Farsi and was uh, initiated, he had his ijazat as a Mesnavi Khan and he used to recite the Mesnavi here before all of the tekes were closed in, in 1925 with the creation of the Turkish Republic. But although this place was turned into a school, he still retained a connection with it and he expressed his love for its traditions by translating, great translation of the Masnavi into Turkish and doing a sharh, a commentary on the Masnavi. So Sheikh Tahir al-Masnavi, uh, 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 Tahir al-Mawlawi, buried here, rahmatullahi alayhi, died in 1951, one of the great people of this teke. The end of one of his ghazals, Rumi says, Khamush bashtu azrenji goft goye mechosp kedar penahi chunan yari mehriban rafti uh, fall silent after the pain of speech and utter not a uh, another word because you are now in the embrace of so hospitable a friend. And that's what applies to the, the dwellers of the, of the graveyard here, the graveyard of the Khamushan, that's where they are. Yari Mehriban, that's where they are uh, in the hospitable embrace of of the friend and silence is that point beyond which there can be no speech beyond the qaba qawsain and it's the ultimate where there is no further differentiation of concept uh, the ultimate so that's um, the reference here in the graveyard of the khamushan let's see if i have time for um i probably don't this is a i've only done two lines of this ghazal i'm sorry to be slow um Let me finish then, rather than starting another line, with something a little different. I'll just go through 
the lives of some of the people who are associated with this teka. So we have some kind of sense of what this place is uh, and of its importance. Some of the great names, some of them uh, actually buried here. A Dede is an elder of the Mevlevi Tariqa. Sometimes somebody can be called Dede without specifically being um, of the Mevlevi Tariqa, but generally um, a Dede is a Mevlevi elder. Similarly, uh, it's not only the Mevlevis who were involved in the reciting and the teaching of the Masnavi. Important to remember that it wasn't kind of their own private property. Faisullah Effendi, in the early, I guess he died about 200 years ago, um, who was a Naqshbandi, a major Naqshbandi sheikh, was also a, a great, some say the greatest ever Masnavi Khan, formal recitation of the Masnavi, which is an art in itself, uh, requiring a knowledge of the modes of, of Islamic uh, cantillation. Uh, and this principle of reciting the Masnavi is something that was important, one of the supreme, almost operatic arts of the Ottoman Empire, and still exists in some places. If you go to the main mosque in Sarajevo in Bosnia on a Thursday evening, for instance, they still have the tradition of Masnavi Khani, of the formal recitation of the, the Masnavi. But with the uh, abolition, the formal abolition of the Turuk, um, the practice has fallen to some extent into desuetude. So uh, you don't have to be Mevlevi to be into the, the Masnavi. Yeah, let's go through a few of these. Um, Abdul Baqi Dede, uh, who was once the, the sheikh of this uh, Tekke about 250 years ago, who was a close associate of Sultan Selim III. Selim III, very important reformist Sultan, the first to bring in some. Europeanizing measures in the armed forces when the Europeans were invading from the north and also from Russia. It's under him that the Crimea is lost to Catherine uh, the Great. Um, and there was a close relationship between Selim III and uh, Abdul Baqi Dede, who was sitting here in this tech care. Of course, this current building is not what you would have seen back then. Um, I gather later on there's going to be a talk about the history of the building, essentially at 16th century but there's nothing 16th century that, that remains because they had a, a very serious fire in 1903, uh, which unfortunately destroyed the library. There was a great library here, but it was wiped out by the fire. Uh, and then Sultan Mehmed Rashad in 1910 had this current structure uh, put up. So this is only 100 years old, what you see here. There's a few fragments of the older structure, but uh, not very much. And then under the Republic, as I mentioned, it became a, uh, a school for a while, and now it's been uh, reopened as this educational and cultural center. So it would have looked different back in the time of Abdul Baqi Dede. Um, Abdul Baqi Dede, uh, a great figure in the history of um, Islamic musicology and cantillation. Many of the ulama and the muftis of the Ottoman Empire were composers uh, as well and great singers. Abdul Baqi Dede was somebody who turned this place in particular into the place to come in Istanbul if you wanted the highest level of knowledge on how to use different kinds of drums, the forms of cantillation of the voice, which maqam to use at different times of day, the uh, tisbih, which you use um, after the Eid prayer, and the uh, sophistic very sophisticated traditions of which things you sing uh, between the rakahs of Tarawih, for instance. I don't know if they're doing it this year in Istanbul. One of those beautiful things that they do sometimes is what they call the Enderun Tarawihi. There are about 30 imperial mosques in Istanbul. That is to say, mosques where the Sultan could pray the Juma, which were imperial foundations, uh, and they have more than one minaret. Under the Ottomans, only an imperial mosque was allowed to have more than one minaret. And the idea was that the Sultan would go to each of these mosques each night during Ramadan to hear the Tarawih. And in order to honor this occasion, the tradition developed that uh, between the rakahs, there would be a very short ilahi, or a religious song, um, in a particular maqam. And then the next two uh, rakahs would be in that maqam. So you would have basically 10 maqams for the Tarawih, and then another one 
for the witter, which would return it to the maqam that you began with, which was usually something like saba or hijaz, one of the easy maqams. So it was a very sophisticated kind of musical experience. And they've revived this recently. Um, one of the great singers of uh, modern-day Istanbul, Mehmet Kemiksiz, you can look at his website, he has a lot of MP3s and things you can download from there, revived it recently. And on his website, you can download the notation and you can hear it in action and see how it works with the specific Quranic ayahs that they would recite because it wouldn't be a whole juz, certain ones that were prescribed for each night, a different combination that you had to use on each night, and then the ilahi and the mode that would follow that. So a very beautiful tradition, and it came ultimately from here, from uh, Abdul Baqi Dede, who uh, turned this place into a, a great center of um, this, and he even gave uh, a book called At-Tahqiq uh, or Tadqiq, which is about the modal system of Islamic music. It was a gift that he gave to, gave to the, the Sultan. Uh, and he invented a number of, of new maqams, and he translated also um, Aflaki's Manaqib al-Arifin. Aflaki comes a little bit after uh, Rumi, but is also from his city, and he writes the first biograph biographical um, collection, anthology, about Rumi's immediate disciples and the early Celebis of his order. And it's Abul Baqi Dede who renders it into Turkish. And you can still find that translation, even though uh, early 19th century Turkish is difficult for a lot of modern Turks. So he is a translator as well, and is buried here, Rahmatullahi Ali. So I guess that the Azan means that I have to fall silent. Shavam, I shall remain silent, and inshallah um, there'll be an opportunity to continue, and I'm sorry only to have done two lines of that ghazal, but I wanted to get some preliminary things out of the way, and I'll try very hard to, to get to the end of it, inshallah, um, the next time we meet. Barakallahu fikum, wa jazakum lahu khairan, wal afu minkum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. مرغ باغ ملکوتم نیم از عالم خاک دو سه روزی قفسی دو سه روزی قفسی ساخت بدنم